Hello and welcome. Welcome to Conversations About Transformation, the keys to lasting change. We're really glad to be here with you. So in a moment, I'll introduce the folks who are going to be having the con conversation, but a little bit about this series of conversations. Um, we here at NLP Marin have paired our master trainers with some of our graduates who are doing extraordinary inspiring things in their life and work, partly with the tools and the perspectives of transformational NLP. So we want to get a sense of what's going on and their unique perspectives on transformation and change. And this is especially timely at this time of year. We're recording this in early 2022. And it's the beginning of a year when everybody wants to change wholeheartedly and wants it to also last. Um, if you don't know us at NLP Marin, we are a training program and the only place in the world where you can learn transformational NLP, which is a unique form of healing and change work. Uh, our students come and go through our curriculum and do their own highly personal, personal growth and learn a skill set um, at cutting edge tools and perspectives that they take back into their lives and their work to do their extraordinary work in the world. Um, so I wanna introduce you and welcome you to today's conversation that we're calling Learning About Learning, the essential qualities that help us learn, change and develop our leadership. Uh, real quick, um, I'll introduce myself. And, uh, and, and who we've got here con conversating today. So I am Liana Silver. I am also a graduate of NLP Marin. I think it was about 2010 when I graduated. So uh, it's been a minute. Um, I have absolutely also taken the tools of transformational NLP and applied them to my life, to my, to my business. Um, I'm an author of a book and I have a private practice as a transformational coach for women. I also work at the marketing department of, of NLP Marin and also assist some graduates and students with their messaging and marketing as well. So I'm really glad to also introduce Alex. Alex, will you do a little hello so people can hello and wave? Hello, everyone. <laughs> Beautiful so, to be here with you. Yeah, great to have you. Alex Kirby is a coach and facilitator. As a coach, he works with leaders founders and entrepreneurs from around the world. He supports them on their journey of reconnecting themselves with more of themselves in service of being and leading with greater choice and presence. Alex is the co-founder of Yellow, a mostly online space where small groups come together to learn and explore in a responsive curriculum-free environment. I love that. Alex also but, writes about philosophy. That is very interesting, yes. Yes, isn't it? Yes, like, is, we're yeah. gonna put in that and come right yeah. back to that. Uh, Alex also writes about philosophy, metaphysics, and the relational nature of the human experience. Also put a pin in that. Um, Alex, did I miss anything reading your official bio? Anything you wanna add? Sounds like more than enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And then also we have Carl, Carl Bukait, co-founder of- Hello. Aaron. Yes. Um, so a bit official, of official news about Carl for over 40 years. I always think that's good to underscore the number 40 years. Carl has practiced, taught, and extended the technology now known as transformational NLP. Carl trains from the heart, backed by a brilliant intellect, insatiable curiosity, and unconventional humor. The result is a fun-filled learning experience where all aspects of the students and their lives are welcomed and included. Carl has been involved in NLP since the mid-1970s. Carl, that's like when I was born. So that I just- I do, I know. This yeah, is, yeah. I, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it makes an impression on me when I hear that, yes. Well, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Many things were born in the mid-1970s. Yes. Uh, Carl is certainly one of the finest practitioners of NLP in the world and quite possibly the busiest. Uh, he challenges his students to explore themselves, the world, and life in a way that respects and uplifts everyone. His ongoing intense private practice with clients keeps what he presents fresh and alive. Welcome you both. 
Let's go. Let's go for it. So we're going to talk about learning about learning. Okay. Yes. Alex, first question for you, which is what is your life and work like as you have incorporated transformational NLP? So where to start with that one? Um, I'll start a little bit about kind of what I do day to day and then how NLP has influenced that and kind of permeated who I am and what I do. Uh, so as you mentioned in the intro, uh, the main thrust of my work is pretty much in, in two realms. One is individual coaching work. Um, I run a coaching practice working with people from around the world, uh, mostly leaders, but also people from all kinds of different walks of life. And uh, what I do or what I hope to do, what I strive to do is to help people to come more and more, as we would say, an NLP into rapport with themselves. Uh, another way you could say that for me is to continuously come home to themselves. Um, and to do that instead of fleeing forward into different strategies that we've developed. <laughs> There's actually a, a Spanish phrase along those lines, um, fleeing forward into the future. Um, but instead to help people to come more and more into connection with who they are, uh, what they're all about and what they wanna do in the world now, as opposed to what has been in the past. And so that's the main, the main focus of my work. Then uh, in yellow, I also lead and run uh, small groups, uh, small groups that for a period of six months or so go on a journey into the unknown. Um, it's a, as you said in the intro, it's a curriculum free program. So we bring people together. Uh, we don't know what we're going to do beforehand for six months. We don't know. And instead, me and my uh, collaborator, Rob Poynton, we design as we go based on the needs of the people who are there, their interests, what's alive for people. Um, so it's really a ride for them as much as for us. And uh, we do everything from conversations about all kinds of topics like uh, yeah, home being one, trauma being another. We do embodiment work. We do breath work. We've done constellations, which is also within the NLP Marin uh, realm. We've done messy art, Shakespeare, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and... Finally, as you said, I write and think a lot about philosophy and also lead some, some coaching uh, trainings um, across various platforms. Uh, but how NLP then, or NLP Marin has kind of influenced me and in what I do. It's, very, it's a very hard question to answer on the one hand because uh, once you go through the NLP Marin program or programs, you, for me at least, it, it becomes kind of part and parcel of your, your worldview, how you see the world, how you see yourself, how you treat yourself. Uh, so, so I have a hard time describing now what has changed because in some ways everything has changed. But if I were to, to pin it down, some of it I've mentioned, so more and more in rapport uh, with myself and what that actually means. Uh, for me, as I said, it means to kind of come home to yourself and be at home with yourself. And it's also given me this kind of, this increased comfortability with the unknown, which is something as a, any human being you face all of the time, particularly in, in my line of work where you're sitting with people, they sit down and you don't know what's gonna show up, what version of this person person is going to show up today what's on their agenda and where will we go i don't know and if i try and constrain or control that i'm hindering that person's learning and growth and development so for me to just be able to sit there and be with the person and i say just sit there it's not so much a just but to be there with the other um, i've noticed after the NLP training that I have such a, a greater sense of ease and ability to just, just be there and rest in myself. Uh, so that's been a huge influence. And then in terms of like yellow leading these non-scripted curriculum free programs, 
right? Being okay with that, being okay when the group goes in a different direction, but that's okay. That's something I, I learned from Carl, right? When someone shares, whether in a session or in, in class, Carl's immediate response, like when someone shares something, it's a, it's a, it's a profound okay. It's not a dismissive okay. It's not an okay of, it's not a flat okay. It's a deeply respectful, okay, this is happening. Now, where do we go? Yeah, what would we those like? Are just some, yeah. Right, yeah. what would you like? So those are some of the few, few things that stick out for me. Mm. Thank you. Oh, no, no, yeah, I say, Alex, that was really nicely said. I, I want to read the transcript of about those four or five paragraphs. Um, I'm going to use a lot of that. Thank you. It's gorgeous. Beautiful. So I'm imagining a piece of learning about learning or just learning is great for some of us, scary for some of us. So I'm imagining a really big piece of that is a comfortability with the unknown. Um, but, but this is a question for both of you. What is learning? Let, let us learn a bit about learning, if you would. Alex, you want to start? Sure. There's a lot I can say. I'll start with a few, few points here. So... <clears throat> I think for a lot of people and many of us who have gone through modern forms of schooling and live in the, the modern world that we view learning as a depositing of information. Um, and people like Ivan Illich and Paula Freire, I think his name is, talk eloquently about this. Um, and this is a very antiquated model and it's not a very human model and we could argue if it is actually a, a accurate model of how we learn but that is how how many people view it right there's some information over here you have a person over here and what do we need to do to learn well we're going to push this over here we're going to deposit it into this person and so in that sense learning sounds like it's a very receptive thing it depends on how much you can take in and deposit within your, inside yourself. Uh, but I'm, I believe that learning is, it's, it's more of a process, right? It's an action. And at the very core of what it means, not only to be a human, but actually to be alive, like to be a living organism um, means you are learning even in single-celled organisms and, and slime mold, you'll see that they'll learn different pathways to different things based on the responses um, that happen in their environment. It's a mutual process of responding to the environment uh, and changing and shifting those responses as we go. And so, so learning is something very natural Right? It's, it's something that is there. We can't help but learn because that's who we are. And so the question for me becomes then, instead of like, how do we learn? Which is interesting and we can talk about that. But for me, more interesting is what's in the way of that natural learning process? What's in the way? What's blocking that? What makes learning feel difficult or challenging? And I mean, for example, one, one thing that I, um, that really kind of landed for me in the NLP work is this notion of organismic rights, um, based on the work of Willem Reich and Alexander Lowen, which basically says that we all come into the world with several fundamental rights, um, and in good enough conditions, they get confirmed. So if we're welcomed into the world, we believe that we have a right to be here. I have a right to my existence. If things, let's say, are a little challenging in the environment, we might have a few kinks 
in our experience of our right to be here. And that's the first one. And there's several others, but there's one or two which have to do with learning, right? the right to take your own actions and the right to have your own consequences. And so if we've learned, it's actually interesting, you know, using the word in that context, if we've learned that it's not okay to have our own actions or consequences, the learning will feel difficult or scary or challenging. The unknown will feel threatening as opposed to enriching, as opposed to a source of adventure and discovery, which it actually is. And so getting more in touch with what's, what's blocking, what's in the way, what's, what's obstructing that very natural flow of learning um, is what comes up when I, when I think about learning. Thank you. Carl, what wait, might you add? Oh, God. Um, as I'm like just thinking about this right this second, I have the word learning in my mind's eye and I have the word change in my mind's eye and there's an equal sign between them. I think that's where I start. And um, understanding things is often difficult depending on one's background and one's previous, well, success in understanding previous things maybe, but learning should be really fun. And um, if I think that if someone learns something, they're not the same someone exactly after they've learned it than before they've learned it. And we often don't get a chance to do very much direct confirmation of, of revisions or updates in our sense of ourselves. I mean, it's important that we do that, but very often life doesn't really offer that. Uh, like you don't, you can't look at the whiteboard and see how you're doing that evolving a, a truer and truer, more and more appropriate expression of yourself in life. But if you keep on learning things, you can be pretty sure you're continuing to do exactly that. So the experience of stepping into the experience of, of, of humans who are concerned about learning, my sense of it is, is that they're not so much concerned about learning, they're concerned about failing in some quantitative or evalu evalu evaluatable way somehow. And those are negative states and unpleasant experiences and fears and shames and guilts and all that kind of stuff. And um, what we work with can pretty much dissolve that kind of thing really quickly if we can find an appropriate way to pay attention to it. And then the, the learning opens back up. So, I mean, I'm sitting here learning, listening to you and Alex. So I guess I just can't help myself. So I'm probably not the right person to be asking. <laughs> And, and the, that point about being open to change actually uh, is so, so fundamental here because it's not only open to change what you know, right? But like change who you are, as you said, yeah. change your sense of identity. Um, you have that, that notion of that one of our prime directives of human beings is to maintain identity coherence. These are Carl's, Carl's words, not mine. But, but under that light, you begin to understand why, why some forms of change or learning are so difficult because if there's one, things, one thing we want to do, it's to keep our sense of self intact. And so I, how do we create an identity where change is actually part of that identity? That's really nice. Maintaining identity coherence does not mean maintaining identity and variability. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Mm. Mm, beautiful. So why does it, Carl is really well said that perhaps it's a fear, it's not fear of learning, but it's a fear of failing. Yeah. That, that really gets, gets us um, caught up. So why does it have to be that like how, how why does it and how does it get to be okay that we fail that we 
fall or flounder or make mistakes um, in the change process? Oh, what an excellent question. <clears throat> For the moment, setting aside certain um, very much immediate action, consequence, action, consequences, situations like <clears throat> landing aircraft or, or uh, night carrier landings, shall we say, the setting aside something like, I had a client one time who was a retired Navy pilot. He said, actually, landing on the aircraft carrier at night in the jet fighter, he said, it's not that hard. He paused and he said, it's just very unforgiving. So, <laughs> <laughs> which is a wonderful line so setting apart those setting aside for a moment those situations where the consequences are kind of unforgiving um, mostly while we're learning things we're really bad at them so it there's a there's a bit of an art form to being able to enjoy the experience of not getting it yet while you're in the process of, of getting it. What we say to our students is to learn what we're all doing here together really well. You don't ever have to do it really well. You don't ever have to really know what you're doing. You just have to be indefinitely and cheerfully tolerant of not knowing what you're doing yet. So I guess this is pretty straightforward. It's part of it is that there's not a terrible consequence for non-performance. And I know there are lots of contexts of learning in the world, I mean, all over the world, where uh, people encounter <clears throat> these one-time life make or break examination experiences and those kinds of things, more so where Alex is hanging out. And, excuse me, but even the learning that goes into pre preparing for those should be fun, so. I've lost track of what I'm supposed to be talking about, Leona. Get me out of this. Alex, get me out of this. Yes. Go, well, stop landing carrier yeah. planes. Okay. And, um, okay. Yeah. Um, how do we make it better to, yeah, to not know and to fail or to flail or to, um, yeah, feel kind of uncomfortable because we're not getting, we're not very good at it yet. Hmm. Uh. I think part of it, again, something I learned from NLP, right? So in the certification process of NLP, Marin, right, you might imagine that there's a <laughs> Carl sitting there at a very, you know, a long table. Maybe there's some other judges or teachers and, yes. and he's secret scoring people with a very... With particular uh, garments on and, 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 of and kind, of a, kind of a plague mask, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd sign up for that though, just to see that. But uh, <laughs> what actually what actually happens is that there, it is a, as they say, a festival of learning and integration. Right? And you could say that that's just a, a nice name, but that is the experience of the, that is the experience of that whole experience. That it is a time for learning and integration. And when it's framed in that way, then there is actually no failure maybe this is a cliche, but I still feel it's important, right? That there, there is no failure, there's only feedback. And if it is a zero sum dichotomy of winning or losing, succeeding or failing, then on the, I mean, just for one thing, there's a lot of pressure in that situation because it's either one of two things. And also, then there's something that's good and there's something that's bad. But if instead the whole realm of what you're experiencing is learning, then it's not, am I learning or not? It's what am I learning? And how am I learning? As opposed to failing. Like a kid who's learning to walk is not thinking, at least in most environments, is not thinking, oh no, I failed when I when I didn't manage to walk now, it's like, oh, I didn't manage to walk. I get up, I try again. Okay. And maybe there's some light frustration there, but failing is part of the process. Um, 
and and I hesitate to use the word failing because it is not a failure. It's part of the process. And and that's something that I think you learn in any kind of um, well structured or not only well structured but a well cared for learning environment, um, which is particularly there at NLP Marin, which is an inc- a continuous inquiry into what is it like for you when you are in these quite intense learning environments, right? So when we're practicing NLP, there will be a an assistant and there will be what we call metas, people who are observing and they will be continuously providing feedback on, on what they see, what works and what they'd like to see more of. And I can tell you in, go on. Oh, that's super. um, Thank you for mentioning, mentioning that Alex, that's really important. What we point out to people is here's what's working and here's what we would like, or perhaps one would like to see more of, right? Right. It's Um, not a stopping. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry, please go ahead. And I'll, yeah, I just finished that point there, which is, in the beginning of my experience of the of this training program was that because of my history my programming my patterning noticing in the ways i wasn't being perfect and not only not being perfect but having other people comment and provide feedback that i wasn't perfect that's like oh no oh god oh Oof. And all kinds of stuff gets loaded up. Maybe I come up with some accusation about them in my head. Oh, they don't know what they're talking about. I did a great job. Or I beat myself up and judge myself or blame myself. And so getting really curious about what happens in those moments when we are faced with our so-called failures, but situations in which we don't do what we hoped we would achieve, right? or where we see that there is a gap where we can learn. What happens in those moments? It's a really fruitful space of inquiry. Um, and I've been blessed just to, to be on this process with NLP Marin because I've gained more of an appreciation and, and value of those moments. It's like, ooh, ooh, it's like something's going on here. There's something for me to, to dive into and to learn and explore here. Okay, interesting, right? We have a I realize as, as as the three of us are talking, we have a like a, a grounding fundamental presupposition about human experience, which is that no learning is no experience. Let me get this correct. No experience is ever wasted. No learning is ever lost. Ever. Let me take a big breath and. Let's have some experience because it's again experience, change, learning, these things are all the same thing. And this also comes from from the the mind of Carl that maybe even we are here to learn. Maybe this is the whole point of this whole thing called being a human is to have experience and to learn. Not learn about anything, but to to learn, to change, to have experience, integrate that experience and move up, move into new possibilities and to have more choice. Well, that's very nice. Nice. If if those are my if that's me then I'm I'm like all you. Alex. Okay. <laughs> well, I I really like hearing it. I think it's yeah. Carl, will you say more about these are fundamental stances? I think of transformational NLP and you and NLP Marin, and they're also sort of guidelines. There's there uh, there's no failure only feedback and there's a you know kind of when giving that feedback (laughs) there's this phrase which is um 
here's what worked and here's what we'd like to see more of. Mm -hmm. So yeah, these are powerful. Would you share a little bit more about them? Sure. Alex was mentioning the neo rakian organismic rights a little while ago. Specifically, he was mentioning that right to take action, to do things, and the right to, the, the slightly formal way we phrase it is the right to have one's own consequences about that. And little kids, like very little kids, learn that they can do things and find out how it went, and then change what they do the next time and find out what came from that and and create this loop where they can take some action and they can correct and adjust and take the action again and correct and adjust and gradually acquire a competence or a comfort about something. Um, if kids don't have the right, if humans don't have the right to take action with except when they have complete certainty about what's going to happen, then they really can learn. They're sort of, they're, they're in a condition of developmental, like a punitive developmental model, which is really awful. And if they are not allowed to fail, let's put that, that word back in there, if they're protected from failure, either because failure is deleted or ignored by whatever the, the by the context that is providing or supporting the learning, if the failure is ignored or if the failure is punished, um, then they can't learn. I mean, if we can't screw it up, we can't get better at it. Um, there's one exception to this, which is a Simpsons episode where Bart Simpson is taking a guitar lesson in the garage from Otto the... Uh, a school bus driver with the old fashioned Walkman headphones. Otto is apparently a very, very good guitar player. We just hear them. We hear Art, or rather Bart and, and Otto in the garage and there's this gorgeous guitar riff. That's obviously Otto giving Bart a lesson. And then there are a couple of horrible little sounds that come from Bart. And then Bart appears in the living room with Homer and Homer says, I thought you were taking a lesson with Otto and, and Bart says, yes, but I tried it when I wasn't really good at it immediately, I just decided to stop. And Homer agrees with him that this is a good way. Setting that aside, don't use that as your model, everyone, but there's no one in the world who just hasn't wanted to do that, right? So also, what, I guess whatever it is that lets us keep going and stay engaged, the art of learning things is to have good enough feelings well enough in a timely way, enough of the time, so that although we're not very good at it or we haven't mastered it or we don't understand, it's fun to keep going. So uh, there are brilliant people in the world who are, you know, lots of brilliant people who arrange this kind of learning context for their students or their associates. Uh, this is really beautifully done. The curriculum free curriculum just sounds like it's really hard to like fall behind in the curriculum if there isn't one. Alex, right. how do you how do you do that? How do you you said that we just find out? I mean, I know what you said. You said, oh, we just find out and we just do it, right? You know, can you say anything more about that? Mm -hmm. I want to know about that. So this this space, um, which we call yellow. Um, it's very much defined by what it's not, right? So there are no learning objectives. There is no prescripted curriculum. There are no presentations. Um, there's no homework, no learning objectives. And so once all that, one, all, once all that goalie stuff, all that structure, all that, not that structure is bad, but that type of structure is out of the way. Mm -hmm. Then what's left is an engagement with what's alive for people, what's happening for people. What are they actually learning, right? Without needing to tell them what they need to learn, because something we kind of hold within our stance in this space is that we treat people as adults. Right? People treat people as adults who want to learn and who can learn. And if we create a space where we're celebrating 
interest and feedback and mistakes or whatever it is, then people will feel inclined to engage more in that process. And then the, the, the way in which we, we help people learn, if that's what we're doing, is by paying attention. I think part of it is the stance that I just described, kind of modeling that learning is okay. We design, like me and my partner, Rob, we, we design the sessions. Of course, we des- after a session, we'll think about what we do next time. But in the sessions themselves, we'll design in the open to actually be upfront and transparent about, I don't know what we should do now. What do you say? Well, I'm leaning this way because I'm sensing something over there. Okay. So to really kind of strip away this theater, right? That we all know what we're doing all of the time, 100% <laughs> of the time. It's like, <laughs> really? How long are we going to keep that charade going? Um, so that's, that's definitely part of it. And then there was one more thing there I was going to say. Um, yeah, so the stance that you have, but then um, how you pay attention which is connected to your stance. But uh, the way we see our work is like we're tending to a a fire, right? And the fire, you light the fire, and then you don't try and control the heck out of that fire. You're not like on top of it all the time, making sure that it's being a good fire. (laughs) Maybe you'll put on a log, maybe you'll prod and poke poke now and then with the stick, maybe you'll blow in a little air when it's needed, but you more or less let the fire be the fire. And, and that's what we hope to do too. Um, that if we do that, help, attend, pay attention, model learning, that, that the rest will take care of itself. Well, thank you. Now, Alex, we were talking before about because sometimes we learn from life, but sometimes we learn from guides or mentors or teachers. And we were talking about essential qualities <clears throat> so that the learning environment is fertile or learning, learning, there aren't so many things in the way of learning. <clears throat> it sounds to me like you just described some essential qualities in a teacher or a guide or an environment. Are there more you'd add? And then we'll turn it to Carl too. Hmm. So I mentioned one before. Now, everything I'm going to say here, don't tell Carl, but everything is actually about Carl here, okay? (laughs) Uh, Being okay with what is happening is one. And I don't mean that in terms of um, condoning what's necessarily happening or supporting it, but being okay with that the experience that is happening is happening. If a teacher can embody that, that opens up so much space because then there is no judgment in what is happening. And judgment is one of the biggest things that gets in the way of learning. And if the teacher is, is simply there respecting what is happening, that, that's a huge one. That's one. Um, second, I think, is like Carl mentioned fun, but like how much joy is there in this person? And how much joy is there in learning for this person? How much do they actually enjoy to learn? Because if that's there in them, then that can permeate in the people they're they're leading and teaching. Of course, there's lots of tactical things, right? There is a craft to teaching. Um, But I don't think that's kind of relevant for, for our purposes here. That's, you know structural approaches and how you speak your clarity your resonance your rhetoric all that that's of course uh, that's applicable but in terms of the again stance is such a beautiful word stance of the person there the teacher a big one is like To what degree is the teacher 
interested, deeply interested in the person or the people that are there. And not intellectually interested, but like from a deep place of care. Um, and even love, like, to what degree are they interested in these people here? Because that, that somehow elevates the whole room and the people who are there. They're, they're seen as more than just objects. I think that's a, a thing so sad about so many different contexts in life and that we interact in a very transactional way, objectifying things and people for, for different uses and purposes. Right? You're in a job because you have this job description and you've got to meet these criteria. Um, and I think it's easy to slip into that as a teacher because you have your learning objectives, you have whatever institution you're representing that needs to achieve certain goals. And so even though there's people living human beings sitting in front of you, they're reduced to a means to an end to achieve whatever goals I have. And so a teacher who can be there and you can feel that they are there because they want to be there with you because it's you and they care about you. I get actually emotional talking about it, but that's such a gift. I mean, it's a gift because you step into a different world and not a different illusory world, maybe an even more real world, if I may use such an expression than we otherwise find ourselves in. It's like, wow, this is what it can be like to be alive. This is what it can be like to learn where I'm fully met. I'm met as a human being and someone cares about me and my growth process. They're not judging me, they're not putting me down. They're deeply interested and they're not overly invested in my learning, right? Because if I am, then the risk is that I'm gonna get a little bent out of shape if you don't learn fast enough. <laughs> Um, and as I said at the beginning, these are, uh, as I've been speaking now, I've been seeing Carl and Carla and the other amazing teachers at NLP Marin who have been sitting in front in the Oaks room, uh, the room where we've been learning. Um, because all of that has been there. All of that has been there. Um, another word, I've uh, finally, uh, a word I'll use, which I've used already, but it, that's respect. A teacher respects their student um, as human beings and as sources of their own learning. My girlfriend says that. I mean, she's a teacher, a primary school teacher. But she says every day, you know, I've got 10 teachers. It's a small class. But I've got 10 teachers. And I think a, a really amazing teacher has that quality. Wow, Alex, thank you. Carl, is there anything you'd add? <laughs> Actually, no, I don't think I want to add anything. That was lovely. I have two last questions. Alex, you might want to take a pass on this one because you kind of already answered it, but let's see uh -huh. if there's anything else. The question, is there anything else you want to say to Carl or NLP Marin? Oh, oh you can't put me on the spot like that. I, I know it's all weepy. I know, I know. She, <laughs> Liana, Liana does uh -huh. this. Yes, I know. It's... Um, it's whatever happens happens uh, it's just, uh, it's, no, it's, that's not what i what i want to get across and it's not the worst it's not the worst <laughs> summary actually but um just 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 a, a deep heartfelt thank you um uh a
Thank you for, for showing and modeling what is possible in this experience that we call life. What is possible both in terms of learning, but what's possible in terms of connection and what's possible by being with what's difficult, um, celebrating what works. <laughs> and for creating a space or spaces where people can feel like they're okay. And, and actually more than okay, but fundamentally that, that we're all okay. Um, that's been such a deep gift to me personally. And I know it, it in some way, shape or form has an impact on the, the people that I work with in whatever ways I, I do manage to channel that, of which I've learned from you, but uh, a day a day doesn't go by where I, for something I've picked up in that room or over the Zoom rooms um, isn't felt or, or thought about or, or talked about. So, so that's one final thing I'll say about, about the work that uh, Carl does is that it, <laughs> It doesn't happen only in time. <laughs> it happens across time, beyond <laughs> time, <laughs> where there is no time. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thank you. So last question, this is for both of you. It's a parting thought what you might leave our audience with it's one thing you wish that they take from this conversation about change or learning. I can offer the, uh, the Latin root for the word experience. It comes from the same root as the word experiment. It means ex experience is about trying stuff out. So um, participation and trying stuff out. For me, it's yeah, to, to what degree can you allow, allow allow change, allow learning, allow that natural impulse, which is there. Another word we haven't talked about is develop, which basically <clears throat> means to unfold. Um, and so what if learning is unfolding? And how can we, as Carl was mentioning there, how, how can we allow ourselves to, to integrate that in, in our sense of identity and our sense of who we are? That we are always unfolding and that's who we are. We're not this fixed thing, we're unfolding. Hmm. Well. Yes, yes. Well, I wanna just remind everybody who's watching and listening that there will, there's links below where you can find out more about Alex and Carl and NLP Moran, et cetera. But I wanna say thank you to you both, wow, what a, what, a, what a gift to be able to have a reunion of sorts and to um, deep, deep dive on this conversation. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you, thank you, Alex, thank you, Liana. Thank you, Carl, thank you, Liana, it's been a joy. Thanks everybody, we'll, we'll see you on the next conversation. Thanks for being here. <laughs>